The Great Pyramid, also known as Khufu's Pyramid, has stood guard over the Egyptian desert for 4,500 years. It's been subjected to tomb raiders and gunpowder-wielding archaeologists, a la Indiana Jones, during that time. The most recent inquiry into the pyramid's secrets, however, is significantly more sophisticated, and borrows from particle physics. To picture the interior of the pyramid, scientists employed muons, a byproduct of the cosmic rays that regularly shower down on our globe. Because particles interact differently with stone than they do with empty space, scientists discovered a previously undiscovered 100-foot-long hole above the pyramid's grand gallery. The good news is that the void exists, the other good news is that it is enormous. So, what exactly is it now? Other people's assistance is required. Mehdi Tayyubi of the Heritage Innovation Preservation Institute is one of the authors of a report published in the journal Nature that details the findings. Perhaps Egyptologists and ancient Egyptian architecture experts can supply us with some theories to simulate and compare with the data we have to come up with some form of architectural explanation for this vacuum. Until then, the newly found space will remain one of many unsolved riddles of this ancient marvel. The Great Pyramid, also known as Khufu's Pyramid, has stood guard over the Egyptian desert for 4,500 years. It's been subjected to tomb raiders and gunpowder-wielding archaeologists, a la Indiana Jones, during that time. The most recent inquiry into the pyramid's secrets, however, is significantly more sophisticated, and borrows from particle physics. To picture the interior of the pyramid, scientists employed muons, a byproduct of the cosmic rays that regularly shower down on our globe. Because particles interact differently with stone than they do with empty space, scientists discovered a previously undiscovered 100-foot-long hole above the pyramid's grand gallery. The good news is that the void exists, the other good news is that it is enormous. So, what exactly is it now? Other people's assistance is required. Mehdi Tayyubi of the Heritage Innovation Preservation Institute is one of the authors of a report published in the journal Nature that details the findings. Perhaps Egyptologists and ancient Egyptian architecture experts can supply us with some theories to simulate and compare with the data we have to come up with some form of architectural explanation for this vacuum. Until then, the newly found space will remain one of many unsolved riddles of this ancient marvel. Influenced by internal and external variables, human conduct is determinate. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. There are two types of influences on determinant, internal variables relating to the individual and external elements pertaining to the environment. As far as the environment is concerned, temperature and air pressure are examples of what individuals believe and how they think about them individually under personal conditions. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on one's determinants. A sample response is, the subject of this talk is the factors that influence human conduct. Both internal and external variables have an impact on it. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. As a general rule, human elements are believed to be internal, whereas environmental influences are considered external. Temperature, air pressure, and what others think about them are examples of environmental elements, whereas personal aspects include what individuals believe and how they think about it. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on human behavior.
Influenced by internal and external variables, human conduct is determinate. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. There are two types of influences on determinant, internal variables relating to the individual and external elements pertaining to the environment. As far as the environment is concerned, temperature and air pressure are examples of what individuals believe and how they think about them individually under personal conditions. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on one's determinants. A sample response is, the subject of this talk is the factors that influence human conduct. Both internal and external variables have an impact on it. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. As a general rule, human elements are believed to be internal, whereas environmental influences are considered external. Temperature, air pressure, and what others think about them are examples of environmental elements, whereas personal aspects include what individuals believe and how they think about it. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on human behavior. I'm Cindy Fisher in the psychology department at the University of Illinois, and I study language acquisition in children between about one and five years old. We do a lot of projects on sentence interpretation, but one of the questions that interests me most is how very young children begin to assign meaning to words and sentences, how they integrate what they know about the world, their concepts of objects and events, with what they know about sentences, their concepts of nouns and verbs, and how they're combined into sentences. And, one of the questions that interests me most is how it could be possible for simple that abstract aspects of the structure of sentences, the syntax of sentences, how the nouns and verbs are combined could begin to affect how children interpret sentences even before they've really learned that much about how the grammar of their language works. How could the structure of sentences be intrinsically meaningful to very young children? I'm helping to push them in the direction of correct interpretations and new learning about the grammar. I'm Cindy Fisher in the psychology department at the University of Illinois, and I study language acquisition in children between about one and five years old. We do a lot of projects on sentence interpretation, but one of the questions that interests me most is how very young children begin to assign meaning to words and sentences, how they integrate what they know about the world, their concepts of objects and events, with what they know about sentences, their concepts of nouns and verbs, and how they're combined into sentences. And, one of the questions that interests me most is how it could be possible for simple that abstract aspects of the structure of sentences, the syntax of sentences, how the nouns and verbs are combined could begin to affect how children interpret sentences even before they've really learned that much about how the grammar of their language works. How could the structure of sentences be intrinsically meaningful to very young children? I'm helping to push them in the direction of correct interpretations and new learning about the grammar. The first ocean deployment of two new high-precision devices meant to detect Earth signals from the bottom has been completed. The tiltmeter and nano-bottom pressure recorder, as well as the power and communication electronics and cabling they require, are all housed in one enclosure. As part of the Mars seafloor, a remotely operated rover placed experiments on the ocean bottom. In Monterey Bay, California, this first ocean deployment of an observatory testbed is placed at a depth of 3,000 feet. There have been numerous major earthquakes in Chile and the Mariana Trench in the future that have been identified by this system. Global seabed observatories with cabled equipment will be connected to each other. A signal that has never been measured before is being detected by these two new devices due to their extreme accuracy.
The first ocean deployment of two new high-precision devices meant to detect Earth's signals from the bottom has been completed. The tiltmeter and nanobottom pressure recorder, as well as the power and communication electronics and cabling they require, are all housed in one enclosure. As part of the Mars seafloor, a remotely operated rover placed experiments on the ocean bottom. In Monterey Bay, California, this first ocean deployment of an observatory testbed is placed at a depth of 3,000 feet. There have been numerous major earthquakes in Chile and the Mariana Trench in the future that have been identified by this system. Global seabed observatories with cabled equipment will be connected to each other. A signal that has never been measured before is being detected by these two new devices due to their extreme accuracy. Get vaccinated against the flu. Your doctor has previously given you this advice. However, for older adults at risk of heart attack, it may be much more critical. Because, according to a new study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, catching the flu increases the chance of a heart attack by six times. Other viral infections can also increase the risk, but to a lesser extent. These viruses put a strain on the system as a whole, increasing metabolism and putting people at risk of heart attacks at risk of a heart attack 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 at Jeff Kwong is an epidemiologist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and Public Health Ontario. Kwong and his colleagues assessed the risk by looking at the medical records of 20,000 seniors who had been diagnosed with influenza. They also discovered that within one week of receiving a flu diagnosis, the group had six times as many heart attacks on average as they did during non-flu control periods. Which, according to Kwong, is just another incentive to get a flu vaccination. It's probably a good idea to have one if you're at a high risk for heart disease, to lower the danger of heart attacks. They also discovered a relationship between the risk of heart attack and infection with other viruses, such as respiratory syncytial virus. Washing your hands regularly, to prevent all kinds of respiratory infections, says Kwong, who offers another piece of advice for staying well throughout the cold and flu season. That technique will also provide some heart-healthy exercise. Properly washing your hands necessitates getting off the sofa. Get vaccinated against the flu. Your doctor has previously given you this advice. However, for older adults at risk of heart attack, it may be much more critical. Because, according to a new study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, catching the flu increases the chance of a heart attack by six times. Other viral infections can also increase the risk, but to a lesser extent. These viruses put a strain on the system as a whole, increasing metabolism and putting people at risk of heart attacks at risk of a heart attack 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 at Jeff Kwong is an epidemiologist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and Public Health Ontario. Kwong and his colleagues assessed the risk by looking at the medical records of 20,000 seniors who had been diagnosed with influenza. They also discovered that within one week of receiving a flu diagnosis, the group had six times as many heart attacks on average as they did during non-flu control periods. Which, according to Kwong, is just another incentive to get a flu vaccination. It's probably a good idea to have one if you're at a high risk for heart disease, to lower the danger of heart attacks. They also discovered a relationship between the risk of heart attack and infection with other viruses, such as respiratory syncytial virus. Washing your hands regularly, to prevent all kinds of respiratory infections, says Kwong, who offers another piece of advice for staying well throughout the cold and flu season. That technique will also provide some heart-healthy exercise, properly washing your hands necessitates getting off the sofa. Given our recent focus on alternative fuels, I thought you would be interested in some information I found about a new fuel that has been making headlines. 
We refer to it as A21. Naphtha and water combine to form this substance. As a greener alternative to gasoline, it appears to be a highly promising fuel. The fact that it is cleaner does not mean that it does not pollute. Unlike some other alternative fuels, A21 does not necessitate the use of entirely new engine designs. With just slight mechanical changes, A21 may still operate in conventional, everyday combustion engines, such as those used in automobiles. As a result, making the switch would not be difficult. Many scholars, including yourself, have questioned the veracity of some of these statements. Some others feared that it might freeze in the winter because it contains around 45% water. It was found that a modest quantity of antifreeze added to the mixture fixed the issue. In Reno, Nevada, A21 has recently been tested on buses. It appears to be working well so far. A rule implemented by Nevada's state legislature mandates that a substantial majority of automobiles in the state operate on alternative fuels, which is a positive thing. This should help. Given our recent focus on alternative fuels, I thought you would be interested in some information I found about a new fuel that has been making headlines. We refer to it as A21. Naphtha and water combine to form this substance. As a greener alternative to gasoline, it appears to be a highly promising fuel. The fact that it is cleaner does not mean that it does not pollute. Unlike some other alternative fuels, A21 does not necessitate the use of entirely new engine designs. With just slight mechanical changes, A21 may still operate in conventional, everyday combustion engines, such as those used in automobiles. As a result, making the switch would not be difficult. Many scholars, including yourself, have questioned the veracity of some of these statements. Some others feared that it might freeze in the winter because it contains around 45% water. It was found that a modest quantity of antifreeze added to the mixture fixed the issue. In Reno, Nevada, A21 has recently been tested on buses. It appears to be working well so far. A rule implemented by Nevada's state legislature mandates that a substantial majority of automobiles in the state operate on alternative fuels, which is a positive thing. This should help. Here, at the Four Winds Historical Farm, old customs are kept alive for the enjoyment of future guests. Today, our skilled thatchers will begin the process of providing this barn behind me a long-lasting, weather-resistant thatched roof. What is their secret? Well, thatching entails covering the roof's rafters, the skeleton of the roof made of wooden beams or rafters, with reeds or straw. Those water reed bundles by the barn are the result of our local thatchers gathering their own natural resources for the work. The practice of thatching in the United States is a thing of the past. That would explain why so many of you have shown here to observe this presentation. However, it wasn't always this way. As in England, the colonists here used reeds and straw to thatch their roofs in the 17th century. However, because to the abundance of wood, they eventually began to replace the thatch with wooden shingles. Other roofing materials, such as stone, slate, and clay tiles, were also used over the years. Most people nowadays don't appreciate just how durable and long-lasting a thatched roof is. It's a true tragedy. Thatched roofs in Ireland, where the technique is still used, can withstand gusts of up to 110 miles per hour. Because straw and reeds are so pliable, this is the reason. When the wind picks up, they sag but don't break like other materials. Another advantage is that the roofs keep the house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. The lifespan of roofs is also an important consideration. On average, they endure 60 years, but they may survive as long as 100 years. Isn't it time for thatching roofs to reclaim their place in the history books?
Here, at the Four Winds Historical Farm, old customs are kept alive for the enjoyment of future guests. Today, our skilled thatchers will begin the process of providing this barn behind me a long-lasting, weather-resistant thatched roof. What is their secret? Well, thatching entails covering the roof's rafters, the skeleton of the roof made of wooden beams or rafters, with reeds or straw. Those water reed bundles by the barn are the result of our local thatchers gathering their own natural resources for the work. The practice of thatching in the United States is a thing of the past. That would explain why so many of you have shown here to observe this presentation. However, it wasn't always this way. As in England, the colonists here used reeds and straw to thatch their roofs in the 17th century. However, because to the abundance of wood, they eventually began to replace the thatch with wooden shingles. Other roofing materials, such as stone, slate, and clay tiles, were also used over the years. Most people nowadays don't appreciate just how durable and long-lasting a thatched roof is. It's a true tragedy. Thatched roofs in Ireland, where the technique is still used, can withstand gusts of up to 110 miles per hour. Because straw and reeds are so pliable, this is the reason. When the wind picks up, they sag but don't break like other materials. Another advantage is that the roofs keep the house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. The lifespan of roofs is also an important consideration. On average, they endure 60 years, but they may survive as long as 100 years. Isn't it time for thatching roofs to reclaim their place in the history books? Kara Fader Meyer is my name. My laboratory at the Beckman uses measures of brain electrical activity to attempt to understand how people perceive language. I'm in the psychology department, and my lab at the Beckman utilizes measures of brain electrical activity to try to understand how people comprehend language. We bring individuals into the lab, strap sensors to their heads to detect electrical activity in the brain, and ask them to read or listen for comprehension in many situations. We may also witness the instant when the brain begins to form the meaning of a word or a phrase by monitoring brain electrical activity. We can also see how different parts of the brain function differently, with the left hemisphere, for example, appearing to make predictions about what words will appear in a sentence ahead of time, while the right hemisphere waits to see what words come in, allowing it to deal with more unexpected language events. We can also examine how these processes vary between people and in different situations, as well as how people's usage of various comprehension methods evolves as they become older. Kara Fader Meyer is my name. My laboratory at the Beckman uses measures of brain electrical activity to attempt to understand how people perceive language. I'm in the psychology department, and my lab at the Beckman utilizes measures of brain electrical activity to try to understand how people comprehend language. We bring individuals into the lab, strap sensors to their heads to detect electrical activity in the brain, and ask them to read or listen for comprehension in many situations. We may also witness the instant when the brain begins to form the meaning of a word or a phrase by monitoring brain electrical activity. We can also see how different parts of the brain function differently, with the left hemisphere, for example, appearing to make predictions about what words will appear in a sentence ahead of time, while the right hemisphere waits to see what words come in, allowing it to deal with more unexpected language events. We can also examine how these processes vary between people and in different situations, as well as how people's usage of various comprehension methods evolves as they become older. Each species appears to be suited to the climate of its particular home, as if it were a norm or a natural law. Animal from the Arctic, or even a temperate zone, for example, would not thrive in a tropical environment, and a tropical species would not survive long in the South Pole. 
However, it is true that the degree of adaptation of species to the conditions in which they reside is overemphasized. We suppose that this adaptation took millions of years if all species are descended from a single form, however a great number of plants and animals transported from various nations are perfectly healthy in their new habitat. There are also some examples of immel species that have expanded their range from warmer to cooler latitudes and vice versa throughout historical periods. Rats and mice are ideal examples, they have been brought by man to many regions of the world and today have a considerably broader range than any other rodent, ranging from the chilly environment of the Faroe Islands in the north to the tropical zones of the Falkland Islands in the south. Adaptation to any environment may be seen as a feature that is part of the physical and mental structure of most creatures' inborn flexibility. As a result, both man and his domestic animals' ability to survive in a variety of climates, as well as the fact that elephants once lived in an ice age while living species now live in tropical areas, should not be viewed as exceptions to the rule, but rather as examples of this flexibility in action under specific circumstances. Each species appears to be suited to the climate of its particular home, as if it were a norm or a natural law. Animal from the Arctic, or even a temperate zone, for example, would not thrive in a tropical environment, and a tropical species would not survive long in the South Pole. However, it is true that the degree of adaptation of species to the conditions in which they reside is overemphasized. We suppose that this adaptation took millions of years if all species are descended from a single form, however a great number of plants and animals transported from various nations are perfectly healthy in their new habitat. There are also some examples of immel species that have expanded their range from warmer to cooler latitudes and vice versa throughout historical periods. Rats and mice are ideal examples, they have been brought by man to many regions of the world and today have a considerably broader range than any other rodent, ranging from the chilly environment of the Faroe Islands in the north to the tropical zones of the Falkland Islands in the south. Adaptation to any environment may be seen as a feature that is part of the physical and mental structure of most creatures' inborn flexibility. As a result, both man and his domestic animals' ability to survive in a variety of climates, as well as the fact that elephants once lived in an ice age while living species now live in tropical areas, should not be viewed as exceptions to the rule, but rather as examples of this flexibility in action under specific circumstances. We've all gone to a historic library and appreciated the scent, but what exactly is a historic library and what does its fragrance mean? During a recent visit to the Wren Library at St. Paul's Cathedral, the UCLA Center for Sustainable Heritage was invited to examine the library's environmental conditions, and we were also asked to read for the first time. I was a little surprised by the scope of the project. Whatever you do, please retain the fragrance, it's very essential to our audience and how people perceive the library, we were told. So it was a major takeaway from our study. And indeed, our ability to communicate with the world around us is largely reliant on our sense of smell. These findings were obtained through research conducted by an advertising agency, which was motivated by a desire to learn more about how we interact with one another and our surroundings. The results show that while the majority of people interact with their surroundings primarily through sight, we can't ignore the importance of smell in the equation. It's also a fascinating topic.
We've all gone to a historic library and appreciated the scent, but what exactly is a historic library and what does its fragrance mean? During a recent visit to the Wren Library at St. Paul's Cathedral, the UCLA Center for Sustainable Heritage was invited to examine the library's environmental conditions, and we were also asked to read for the first time. I was a little surprised by the scope of the project. Whatever you do, please retain the fragrance, it's very essential to our audience and how people perceive the library, we were told. So it was a major takeaway from our study. And indeed, our ability to communicate with the world around us is largely reliant on our sense of smell. These findings were obtained through research conducted by an advertising agency, which was motivated by a desire to learn more about how we interact with one another and our surroundings. The results show that while the majority of people interact with their surroundings primarily through sight, we can't ignore the importance of smell in the equation. It's also a fascinating topic, 